And, um, I'm just grateful for what God's doing here at Transformation Church in the midst of 2020, what has seemed to be one of the most challenging years of human history. <laughs> I, I see God's hand in it. And, 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 and I want to make sure that Transformation Church, that we are not swayed by um, culture more than we are um, concrete and anchored in the kingdom. And so today, I, I just want, no matter what happened for you emotionally this week, I want you to know that you are not a citizen first of the United States of America. You are a citizen of heaven. And we have responses in heaven's system and kingdom that produce results on earth as it is in heaven. And so when everything's going crazy, we have the weapon of praise. When everything's going nuts, we have the tool of prayer. When everything is going haywire, we can lift the hallelujah. And when you understand that, it affects what happens down here. So I'm just encouraging you, don't forget what you come stocked with, being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Make sure it doesn't just reflect in this time that we're on this stream. Make sure it reflects tomorrow when you're at work. And your racist friend starts talking about the past week. Where's your citizenship? I'm just telling you there is no greater time for the church to be the church than right now. And this series is going to help you. And I got a word today. And um, there's so many things I want to do right now. Like I just feel like I just feel like having a praise party at this this exact moment. Yikes. Mom, be quiet, mom. Pastor Brenda right there, she will, she will just interrupt everything. But she's been, she's, she's been one of those that have seen the faithfulness of God over decades. And after you see God do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, there's a praise that wells up on the inside of you. And I don't know about you, but some of y'all done seen God go, uh, y'all done seen him come through over and over and over and over and over. And I know some of y'all sitting there and you thought it was you, but it was the grace of God. I'm standing here today because of the grace of God. Yikes! Some of y'all too bougie to remember that you prayed and asked God, if you get me out of this, I'll serve you. If you change this situation, I'll love you forever. I'll put that away. If you would just give me one more opportunity, and you're still here. I don't know if it's the camo. I'm ready to fight. Okay, let me stop. Let me stop. Woo. All right. Good morning. Welcome to Transformation Church, where we love God, and we are unapologetic about the praise that he deserves, man. Um. The reason that I'm so excited is because every year I come and stand in this spot and I go around a year of being the pastor of Transformation Church. Um, it's coming up on my birthday season and I get real reflective like in this time. And one of the things that I'm reflective of in this time is the grace of God for Transformation Church. Um, when I started leading this church almost six years ago, um, we didn't have a bunch. We had a strong vision, a few people, a few people, and we had the Holy Spirit. And that's why y'all always hear me say, all you have is all you need. When I look at what God has done in these six short years of ministry, it's not Pastor Mike's preaching ability. <laughs> it's not good systems and marketing and graphics. All of that stuff is icing on the cake. This is a bunch of people with faith. Everybody say faith. I said say faith. And I dare say crazy faith. To believe in impossible moments. And one of the things that this culminates, because people say they have faith, but then we come to a point as a church where we have an opportunity to really exercise or stretch our faith or prove that we have faith. Because the Bible tells us faith without works is what? <laughs> it's dead, deceased. And uh, every year... We have uh, what we call an end-of-the-year offering. And this year, 
God told me, he said, Michael, this is going to be a crazy faith offering again on December 6th. I just want to let you know, I'm not taking an offering right now. On December 6th, we are going to be doing probably one of the most spiritual acts that we do as a church every year. Is we're going to pray and ask God as a family, as a couple, individually, God, if you want to stretch my faith in the area of generosity, what do you want me to give? People always come up to Pastor Mike and come up to me. I hate Pastor Mike. Anyway, they come up to me and they're asked, like, what should I give? And I say, I don't know. Like, that ain't got nothing to do with me. And many churches try to put amounts and numbers and stuff. I hear a Psalms 133 blessing right now. If you got $133 or $1,333 or 1, 000, like they try to do all that stuff. I don't believe in none of that. All I believe is if God... You go to him and say, God, what am I supposed to sow? What am I supposed to do? He'll tell you from experience. He usually challenges me. It's a sacrificial gift. It ain't like, a, oh, yeah, that's cool. It's something that's a sacrifice. And then all he's looking for is obedience. Everybody say obedience. I can't go into it because I got to preach. But there are many times that me and Pastor Natalie have stepped out as the leaders of this church and given what we did not have to give. And I have watched how God has honored his word over our lives and my staff and members and everybody. I, the stories are so crazy, but you never can get what's on the other side until you obey. And so I'm asking everybody, December 6th, we're going to come to this place and not just come to this place like everybody coming physically, but we're going to come to this moment. And it's going to be a holy moment. And we're going to gather. We're going to show our children's children how to honor the house of God. And this is one thing that I was very passionate about with COVID and all of this other stuff. This is a holy moment. Like, I, I want people to have an experience of giving. And so what we've done, December 6th is going to be the offering here at, at when we do it all around the world. But I've provided with the team a way for people to actually come and actually give their offering. From November 30th through December 5th, what we have done is basically done a reconstruction of our lobby. Like literally, like since ain't nobody here, we done built three rooms that we're calling experience rooms that will have worship music playing. They will have um, um, different, I just, you're just gonna have to come see it. I'll make sure they show you some video of it. But it's gonna be a moment. I'm telling you, some of you, God's gonna prompt you to drive, to fly, to come and actually give this gift. It will be a journey of faith, a step of faith. This is not for everybody, but I just wanted to make sure some of you, the sacrifice you're going to give, it ain't just a click away. You want to listen here, Lord, ah, take it. Why are you saying that, Pastor Mike? Because for some of you, this is going to be the thing that changes everything. I remember the first time that God challenged me to give $1,000. I did not have it. And when I saw God change my heart not that I have to give but I get to give it changed my world it changed my world and this is I don't care about the amounts I just want you to stretch your faith so I'm gonna pray for everybody that wants to participate that doesn't want to participate some of y'all just tuned this out it's all good like this ain't we not counting people and let me see what you did and what you did ain't none of that happening this is an everybody say opportunity it's an opportunity for your faith to grow. And I really want to tell you about something that is almost done. There's some stuff that God is doing at Transformation Church that's expanding the borders of what he's calling us to do. But, but he needs all of us to participate. And so in this season, I'm going to ask you, Father, right now, I'm asking you to just touch our hearts. Father God, you're calling us into a season of walking in faith. Father God, forgiveness requires faith. And Father, as we step into this crazy faith offering, I thank you for touching the hearts, the minds, and the resources of those people who are part of Transformation Church. Father, this ain't no get rich scheme. This ain't no prosperity gospel. You give a little, God's going to give a little. This is all about heart, God. There is no um, pressure 
or compulsion. Father, we're six weeks away or seven weeks away. We're not trying to convince anybody. I'm just asking that you would speak to your children. Father, and those that desire to give, your word says you will give seed to the sower. So, Father, our first, our first job is to make it up in our heart that we want to sow. And Father, I thank you for the miracles that will be produced for us to get the seed. God bless Transformation Church. We will always be a church that is generous and full of faith. And I just thank you that it's not just for this house, it's for every one of their houses. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. Father, I thank you in advance for the testimonies that are coming, Father God, to people's household as they step out in faith. We trust you, we believe you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody say, we agree. We expect, amen. Hey, can you just clap your hands all over the building and all over the world? All right, y'all ready? Today, we are in week seven of a series we're calling Help Me, F You. Now, some of y'all, bring that in here for me, Joe. Now, some of y'all are new to this series, okay? And um, y'all haven't learned the chant that we do around here. So I need everybody in the auditorium to stand up. Come on, y'all help me. And all you're going to do, because FU stands for Forgiveness University, this is a, 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 a higher education um, for everybody. So we're going to do this. Tony, I need you to help me over there. You ready? Look, we're going to start the drum line. You ready? One, two, three, and Come on, help me. Eh. Let's take it as you. Woo! Come on, go to church for me. Let's do it. Uh uh. fake. If y'all was at an HBCU right now, y'all be ah. I told people I'm going to have fun in this series. Let's go. Hey, listen, week seven of Forgiveness University, I honestly did that to wake some of y'all up right there, okay? Um, I really do believe God has given me a word today, and I do believe that church should be enjoyed, not endured. And um, I'm out of breath. Okay, um, Something happened to me this week that was kind of funny. Um, this is football season for a lot of people, college football, high school football, NFL, all that other stuff. And so I had some family members go to a high school playoff game. And they were all excited about going to this game. And when I came to them, my question to my family member was, hey, did the team win the game? And their response to me was the referees were horrible. That, that's not what I asked you. I said, did the team win the game? And they said to me, they didn't call the game fair. And it hit me that the person never answered, did they win or lose? They were always trying to let me know that it was an un fair game. And I started thinking about this topic of forgiveness. And I started looking at champions who actually win games. And I want you to take down this point because it's the premise of what we're about to go through. A true champion must always overcome unfair. Anybody who's actually going to be a champion, there will be a game where they didn't get all the calls right. There will be a game where they didn't see the foul play. There will be a game or a play that people will do the wrong things and nobody is held accountable for it. If you're ever going to be a true champion, a true victor, a true overcomer, you have to overcome unfair. And as I begin to go through this, the Lord just began to talk to me. 
He said, Michael, when it comes to forgiveness, forgiveness is only needed when it's in an unfair situation. You don't need forgiveness if everything was fair. If you understand what I was saying and you got the real thing, forgiveness is needed. And he said, and if you need an example of a champion who overcame unfair, look no further than your example in life, Jesus. Think about why we call him our champion. Think about what he had to go through. Everything that Jesus went through for us was unfair to him. He was beaten, he was blamed, he was betrayed, he was taken from his home, he was dogged by people that were cheering for him one day, he was scourged, he was nailed to a cross. All of this stuff happened to him and he died for us and it was all, everybody say, unfair. Amen. Yep. And I begin to think about this. Because we always talk about triumph and victory. This is one of our favorite scriptures. And it is very true. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 13. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. It says, but thanks be unto God who in Christ. Everybody say in Christ. So if we're in him, always leads us or causes us to triumph. Because when we're in Christ, we're going to win. When we're in Christ, we're going to get the victory. We're going to triumph when we're in Christ. He says when we triumph, we are as trophies of Christ's victory. That's why he wants us to triumph over situations that are bad and un unprofitable and unfair. He wants us to win because these are the trophies. Me and you are the trophies of his goodness in the earth. It says it spreads and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. How the world will know that he's real is that we can overcome unfair situations. But this is what I begin to think because we always talk about triumph and go into our next victory. Write this down. Triumph means victory. Victory, you may have never thought about this, means battle. We're going to victory to victory. That means you're going from battle to battle. God's taking me to another level and I'm going to see a victory. That means he's taking you to another battle and you're going to see a victory. I'm going to the next level in my company and I'm going to see victory. I'm going to the next battle in my company and I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to be successful in my marriage. I'm going to battle in my marriage. And I want to frame this so that you can always see that triumph, which we have in Christ Jesus, means victory. But you never get a victory if you never have a battle. So the battle is prerequisite for the victory. And I know ain't nobody praying those prayers. Thank you, Lord, that next week is going to be the greatest battle of my life. What do we say? Thank you, Lord, that next week is going to be the greatest victory of my life. I'm fine with you saying that as long as you know the victory's on the other side of the battle. Okay? Now watch this last part. Triumph means victory. Victory means battle, and battles are always unfair. All's fair in love and war. Is that what they say, love and war? Because when you're going against somebody and you're trying to win, I'll do anything to beat you. Yeah, that, that's why some of the husbands and wife right now, when y'all get in a heated argument, you start bringing up things that you know are low blows. Yeah, I don't cook that good, but that's why your ear is little. Like I told you that one time I had insecurities about my ear. And because when you're in a battle, you don't fight fair. You've never been in a battle that it was like, now everybody do the right thing and everybody keep your, your hands and your comment. No, in a battle, unfair always happens. And what happens when there's unfair, you have offense. When somebody does something to you that is not just, that does not have mercy attached to it, that did not consider me, I have a very high opportunity to be offended. And so if I'm going from battle to battle, that means that there's always going to be a chance that somebody's going to do something to me that is unfair. 
that something is going to happen to me that was not warranted. And now what do I do with that offense? The reason that most people don't forgive is because, because no one has acknowledged what happened to them was unfair. I'm going to say it again. The reason why most people do not forgive is because no one in their life has ever acknowledged what happened to you was unfair. So you hold on to it trying to, to protect yourself for dear life. I'm never going to let my family forget what they did to me. They don't even know. But because nobody in your life ever acknowledged that it was not fair, you feel like you have to protect yourself. And today, I want to give you the title of my sermon, which I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit is about to free some people today. Forgiving unfair. Yep. Because it was unfair. What happened to you was unfair. Today, I'm going to be your dad. I'm going to be your therapist. I'm going to be your mom. I'm going to be that first relationship. What they did to you was unfair. You didn't deserve it. You didn't do anything to qualify for it, but you still got it. And the reason you've been holding on to it and trying to be able to have some type of control is because nobody ever came and acknowledged that was so wrong. And that was unfair. Can I give you my second point? And it's very simple, but I need you to think about it. Unfair is never fair. You can never make fair out of an unfair situation. And that's what we do to try to cope. Well, I'm, I know my daddy had some real issues and there was some drug abuse and, and some different things happening. So I know he couldn't be there for me and I know he was doing the best that he could. And I know, no, it was unfair that he had a child and was not there for it. And you cannot make fair out of unfair. You didn't ask to be born. You didn't ask to do that. But you got born into a fallen world where people made decisions and it was unfair that you had to go to all your graduations and nobody was there. I'm coming to validate you today. It was unfair that your brother and your sister got all the accolades because they did sports and your family's a sports family. But you were more about academics so you didn't get the attention. They didn't show up for your spelling bee because it was unfair. It was unfair that they didn't give you an opportunity to use your gifts in that church. Because you had been there for all of that time and you were developing slowly, but they only put up the superstars. It's unfair that they didn't see the gifting that God was growing in you and they were comparing your seed to a tree. It's unfair. It happened. It's unfair that you were treated how you were treated in your family. It's unfair that the burden of being a single mother and being a caregiver to your child with special needs by yourself, that's unfair. It's unfair that you trusted that leader and they took advantage of you because you were loyal. It's unfair. It's unfair that the record company did not use and promote you the way that you were supposed to be promoted and used. It's unfair that that business passed you over for promotion because of your skin color. It's unfair. I'm just trying to connect with somebody right now. It's unfair that it took all of these years to get a woman in the highest seat in, in, in our country. That's unfair. I'm just trying to help you understand it's unfair, but what do I do with it when it's my reality? It's my reality. It's, I'm, I'm here, I'm hurt, I'm broken, and it's unfair. And the thing that, that I'm, I'm, I'm saying this and trying to get everybody to connect with it is because the only way to fix something is to validate it first. You can never fix anything that you don't validate is real. I ain't got no daddy issues. I ain't got nothing. Baby, you broke. You been broke. You're not working for success because you just want to have a comfortable life. You're working to prove yourself to your father who's dead. 
If you don't acknowledge that it's that that and validate how you feel, you can't fix it. And that's all God's trying to do is illuminate stuff in your life, and you're like, no, 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 that ain't it. You've been from man to man to man to man, and you don't have a problem with insecurity. I'm confident I'm a bad B. I can do whatever I want to do. I step Birkin bags and DC bags. We, we see the little girl who didn't get presents. So now you provide for yourself and flash all of this stuff. Does it keep you warm at night? All I'm saying is if you act like it is not valid in your life and we don't validate it, it can't be fixed. And so that's why John 16, 33, I want to help somebody get peace. Jesus said, I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many unfair situations happen. You're going to have so many battles, so many trials, and so many sorrows. It's going to be unfair everywhere. If you're breathing, something's going to happen to you that is unfair. Let's just take it. Has anybody had anything to happen to them in this year that you felt was unfair to you? Come on, hands. Just lift it up. Okay? So that's everybody. The word is true, but look what it tells you. But take heart because I, Jesus, have already overcome the world. And that's why we need to identify today if we're really just going to talk about forgiving or if we're actually going to do the things that it takes to identify the areas in our life where it's been unfair and it's hard to forgive. Let me help you. It is hard to forgive when your wife walks out on you. When she cheats on you with somebody else or your husband cheats on you with somebody else, that is unfair and it's hard to forgive. I'm not talking about no magic tricks. And y'all see some people, this is too deep for me. Do you want to be healed? I'm trying to give you life today. But that means we're going to have to forgive unfair. And there's two teams playing. There's a battle I talked about. And, and you know, we're, we're here at Forgiveness University. F you. And I found that there's another university that most of y'all think y'all signed up for this university. But you signed up for fake Forgiveness University. You didn't sign up for Forgiveness University. You signed up for fake Forgiveness University. And people have degrees in fake forgiveness. Some of y'all think you have forgiven. Like you see the little post on Instagram, you be like, I did that three years ago. Let's just see. See, people who are in fake forgiveness university, they're prideful. And people who are in forgiveness university understand their need for God and they're humble. Okay? I want you to identify yourself. I'm not telling you where you are. I just need you to identify yourself. People who are in Faith Forgiveness University, they keep count of offenses. How many people have you made tallies on of how many times they've messed you over? People in Forgiveness University, they lose count of offense. Remember that 70 times 7 that Jesus requires of us, that wasn't to keep score, that was to lose count. Okay? People in Faith Forgiveness University, they think forgiveness is an option. I'll forgive when I get ready. I'll forgive when they apologize. I'll forgive when blah, 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 blah. But the thing that you have to know about people in Forgiveness University is they know forgiveness is mandatory. People in Faith Forgiveness University, it gives people what they deserve. But if you're in Forgiveness University, you give people grace that you don't deserve. If you're in Faith Forgiveness University, you focus on the faults of others. You did it. But if you're in Forgiveness University, you focus on the forgiveness provided by our Father. And the last thing, if you're in Faith Forgiveness University, I just want you to identify yourself. Forgiveness is only acceptable when circumstances are fair. But in Forgiveness University, forgiveness comes when circumstances are unfair. I need to help you forgive unfair. I ask the Holy Spirit, how can I help people? Because when I start to think about all the unfair situations that happened in my own life, I start to get really upset. 
there's a lot of emotions that start coming when I think about all the things that happened to me that were unfair. And God gave me probably the most like 3D version of a Bible story that I've ever seen in life. And I hope it helps you today. Today, we're going to look at the story of Joseph. Because Joseph had to learn how to forgive unfair. Now, y'all know Joseph's story, right? Joseph, the, the young boy with the coat of many colors, he had the Gucci jacket his daddy gave him, and he was flaunting. And one day he came um, to his brothers, because the brothers didn't really like him that much anyway, because his daddy um, kind of liked him more because he was born to him in his old age. And he came flossing his Gucci jacket, and, and he told his brothers this dream he had. He was like, yo, basically one day I saw y'all kind of bowing to me. And his brother was like, fool, what you say? Don't ever say that again, or I'm going to bust you in your face. And he was like, oh, snap. And then he came back again because he had another dream from God and he was like I can't help but tell you guys there was another dream and uh, y'all were kind of bowed to me and even his dad was like that's a little interesting right now and the Bible says that Joseph's brothers had content hate and offense in their heart for him they had so much offense in their heart for him that one day when Joseph's father sent him to go check on him Joseph goes to check on his brothers and the Bible says his brothers saw him from a far way off and they were plotting of how to kill him. Now that got to be some real hate when you see your brother like, hey Joseph, now are we gonna slit his throat or is we going what is we gonna do? Like think about it. And literally he comes to them and, and right when he gets up on him, they make a plan to rob him unfairly of his future. Now I, now I gotta say to you, as some of you are sitting here right now, there have been situations that have happened to you that have tried to rob you unfairly of your future. I know we don't talk about that that much, but his brothers planned to kill him. So what they did was they threw him into a well, basically. And while he was down in the well, because one brother was like, we're going to smash him out. And he was like, we don't want that blood on our hands, so let's just hurt him real bad. Put him into um, um, this well, the cistern, the Bible calls it, and let's leave him there. And he'll definitely die down there because there's no water or no food. And then one of the other brothers saw this caravan of people coming up like, nah, let's get something out of this. Let's not just hurt him. Let's be flagrant to him. Let's get paid for hurting him. And they pull him out of this pit. And I I just can imagine for a second Joseph thinks maybe my brothers lost their mind. Oh, there you go right there. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. And they then sell him into slavery. Joseph has done nothing to them but tell him a dream. It doesn't seem right. And he gets sold into the land of Egypt. The thing about Joseph, and I need everybody to hear me say this right now, is Joseph, through his entire life, just like you, have several opportunities to sit in the chair of unfair. What Joseph had been at that moment by his brothers is betrayed. And what happens for all of us when we walk into the situations that were unfair the first chair of unfair that you have to avoid sitting in that I know tons of people are sitting in right now is the chair of betrayal. Your family members betrayed you. The reason why I call it betrayal is because you can never betray somebody if there's not already trust there. So there are people right now that you haven't been betrayed by, you've just been hurt by them or frustrated by them. The only people you can be betrayed by is people who are close enough to cut you. And this is the stuff we don't talk about right now because it really hurts. But if we're honest about it, some of us have been sitting in the chair of betrayal because it was unfair that they didn't tell us who our father was. It's unfair that our brother and sister told on us in that situation and said the thing that we never told anybody else. It's unfair that that coworker exposed us when we were just having a moment of frustration See, the thing that the enemy wants you to do is sit down in the seat of betrayal. And some of y'all are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and you have become so comfortable in this seat. Woo! 
do the plan of God for my life? No, I've been betrayed. Ugh. Don't ask me about purpose because at the last church I was at, they betrayed me. I trusted that worship leader. I trusted that pastor. I trusted that kids worker. You ain't never give me back because I've been betrayed. And people spend decades of their life not fulfilling the purpose of God on their life, not fulfilling the plan of God on their life because they would rather sit in the seat of betrayal than to finish the call of God on their life. What if Joseph, after his brothers sold him out, on the way to Egypt in the back of this caravan would have said, that's it for me. God must not have a plan for my life. I've been betrayed by the people who I've known. Do y'all understand that Joseph was 17 years old when this happened? 17 years old, he could not even fully develop and mature and, and think what he was going through at that moment. And literally the most traumatic thing in his life happens to him. The brothers that he probably took baths around, who probably played games with, who ate with every night, the people who were closest to him cut him so deep. But there's something interesting about Joseph is he did not stay seated in Betrayal. He was able to somehow keep moving in an unfair situation. Like I'm trying to figure out if the overcoming, if that part of it has to do with us still being able to move forward, even if it's unfair. Let me, okay, let me help you, let me help you, let me help you. Okay, so, so Joseph is in an unfair situation. And he gets betrayed by his brothers. I got to go through this quickly because I got to get you to see it. Okay. But then he gets sold from that caravan that takes him to Egypt. He gets sold into slavery to Potiphar. Potiphar is one of the royal guards. And Potiphar begins to see the anointing on Joseph's life. And puts him in charge of a whole bunch of things. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 39.7 that Joseph was a handsome man. A handsome black man. I, I, maybe, I, maybe I just made that up. But he was a handsome man. And Joseph was working one day, and Potiphar's wife was a cougar. She was an older woman who had a thing for younger men. And literally every day, the Bible tells us that Joseph would be doing his work, and she was like, come sleep with me. Like every day, <laughs> this is how it went in my mind. Every day she was like, you want some of this? I got some for you. I got what you want. I got all what you need. <laughs> like she, every day. And Joseph was saying, woman, do you not understand that in an unfair situation I have found success? And I'm not about to let nobody mess this up for me. And Joseph one day caught himself in the wrong situation and got pinned down by the cougar. And he was like, woman, get off of me. And he somehow gets out of the situation and she has his coat. She starts screaming, oh, Joseph tried to get my goodies. Not my goodies, yes, my goodies. <laughs> and she, the Bible says she screams until Potiphar comes. And says, throw him in jail. He tried to rape me. Now, if I'm Joseph, I'm on the run. But I'm hearing what the accusations are. And this is unfair. I was betrayed by my brothers. And now the second seat that the enemy would try to get you to sit in so you don't forgive unfair. Now I've been blamed. I got blamed for something I didn't do. I got painted to be an angry black person. I got painted to be a racist white person. I got blamed that I was this. I got blamed that I was that. So I'm not going to do what God's called me to do because I'm going to take a seat in blame. My family betrayed me and now you going to blame me? I'm not serving God. I'm not forgiving nobody. Blame feels kind of good. 
I can now not take responsibility for anything that I do. I can now blame everybody else. It was the family I was born into. It is the socioeconomic class. It's the white man. It's the black man. It's the Republicans. It's the Democrats. It's this. It's that. I'm going to blame everybody, and I'm going to stay in it. I ain't forgiven this. This is unfair. I ran away from it, and I still got blamed. I didn't even smoke it. I didn't even touch it. I didn't even do it. And I still got blamed. Wow. Wow. Nah, man. F that. And not forgive it. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand right now. What God wants you to do is say F you. He wants you to forgive unfair. But some of us are for forfeiting our ultimate that's another F you, forfeiting our ultimate plan that God has for us, forfeiting what God wants to do because we want to sit in the chair of unfair. And you know the crazy thing about sitting in blame? Because it's your fault and 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 your fault. I'm not saying that they don't have some fault in it. But if you don't move from this chair, if you find comfort right here, what ends up happening is you start replaying the situation and it starts changing your character. If I was Joseph, I would have been one of those people that had been like, dang, this is unfair. Maybe I should have. Maybe I should have tapped it or maybe I should have. See, you start taking your integrous actions. Maybe I should have cussed them out. Maybe I should have done it. Because if I'm still going to get blamed for it anyway. And what happens is we sit in this place of blame. Joseph's brothers betrayed him. And then he got blamed by Potiphar's wife. And the, after he got blamed by Potiphar's wife, he ended up in jail. Like, I want you to understand, it wasn't like, hey, bro, I understand, you know, my wife, sometimes she's wild, and, and I understand this is not a really good situation. You know what I'm saying? We've been working on that for a little bit. Like, that wasn't it. He suffered full consequences for something he did not do. This is where the enemy tries to trip us up. But I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's going to allow some people to get up out of these chairs. Some people who have been betrayed, he's going to allow you to get up. No, somebody's got to hear me. He's going to allow you to get up out of the seat of betrayal. Get out of the seat of blame. Joseph was able to keep being effective even though he was in unfair situations. Woo! He's in jail now. And in jail... Because he's not in the seat of blame, he's still nimble. He's still able to be used by God. See, when you don't sit in the chair, you're not confined to whatever this chair is telling you. When you stay up, I'm close to blame. I want to I wanna sit down in it. I'm, a matter of fact, I kind of, every uh, once in a while, I hit them with a, ah, 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 but I won't stay there. You won't catch me staying in this position. Because he didn't sit, and everybody would tell him he had the right to. If he came and counseled with you, you'd be like, yeah, I understand. I know I would have done the same thing. I would cuss him out too. I'm like, yeah, yeah, if he, if he cheated on you, go find you somebody, girl. No, you need to leave that church. Start your own church. Yeah, they don't see, they don't see, don't see what you do. No. Nah. No, no, no. Forget the scripture that says, be humble and wait on God, and at the right time, he'll lift you up. Lift yourself up. Start your own business. Do your own thing. Go from under the covering. <laughs> Get unsubmitted. That works. Because that's what happens. Oh, you know when you're betrayed, you find other people that have been betrayed. Charles, Grayson, Holly, come, come. Come sit with me. Because you know, just sit right here. Come on. I need some other people. Come here, Holly. You look like you've been betrayed before. Sit right here. I need one more person. Come, 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 um, uh, come here, Dylan. Come here, real quick. 
See, when you find people that have betrayed you, sit on my lap, sit on my lap right here. When you find people that betray you, we go on a ride together. <laughs> Let's talk about all of the great people who did us wrong. Yeah, come on. Let's come continue on. to build friendships around dysfunction. Wow, wow, yeah, yeah. Let's all talk about how if we were to ever do this, we would do it different, but we've never been in people's shoes before, so we don't know what we're actually going to do. And so at the end of the day, we build relationships around dysfunction because we found people that are dealing with the same thing as us. Let's get up real quick. Y'all sit right here. Y'all stay right there. But now I've been blamed. Give me some more people real quick. I've been blamed. Yep. Come sit around here with me. Yep. No, you sit on my lap. You light enough. Dylan was a little heavy. I'm just playing. Now watch. Now watch. You can all, I need, I'm just trying to bring a point home. You can always find somebody to agree with your dysfunction. I need you to hear me. What if Joseph would have just said when he got done wrong and now he's in jail and there's a cupbearer and a baker there? And they had a dream and they needed somebody to interpret the dream. What if Joseph would have said, man, I don't care nothing about your dream. I'm sitting here because I got done wrong. And because I got done wrong, I don't care what happens to y'all. I don't care about your family. I don't care about your bread. I don't care about your cup. I don't care what happens to you. But because, let me get up real quick. Y'all stay sitting right there. Because Joseph could see blame but didn't sit in it, he was able to be used by God. I need everybody to hear me say this. God still wants to use you even though you're in an unfair situation. I'm going to say it again. God still wants to use you even though the place you're in right now is unfair. Joseph is sitting in jail. These two dudes come with their dreams. And Joseph says, Probably distraught, frustrated, and hurt. If you let me, me and God kind of got this thing where I can interpret dreams. If you want to tell me your dream, I'll tell you what God says. And these two dudes, they tell him his dream, and he says, all right, uh, good news for the cup bearer. Um... You're going to be restored back to the palace in three days, and you're going to live. And the baker was like, so what about my dream? Bad news for you, bro. In three days, he's going to call you up. You're going to be happy. Then he's going to impale you. You're going to die. Pour some out for the homies. (laughs) And then he returns to the cupbearer. After he's been massively offended two times in his life, betrayed by his brothers and blamed by Potiphar's wife. And he says, yo, bro, I'm, my life has sucked so far. Um, don't really deserve to be here at all. Um, when you get on the outside, could you just remember me? Like, could you just put in a good word that, yo, there was this dude, he tells dreams. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's a good guy. He didn't really do all the crap that everybody's blamed him for and that he betrayed him for. He's a good guy. And the dude was like, bet. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I got you, I got you, I got you. Do y'all know what happened? Do y'all know what happened? Two years goes by. Two. Joseph was 17 when this stuff started. The unfair situation started. This man is now a decade into all of this unfair life that he's been in. And he tells the cupbearer, cupbearer gets out, he's excited, pouring it up, doing everything. And the Bible says, it literally says, he thought no other thought about Joseph. Do you know that the third chair that the enemy tries to get us to sit and stay in? The chair of unfair, it's the chair when people bypass you. And this is the one a lot of people are living in right now. It might not have been the betrayal. It might not have been the blame, but they keep passing me up. They don't see me. 
My feelings don't matter. My hurt doesn't matter. Somebody's always more talented. Somebody who's, I did it. I, I, I did what they said to do and they still forgot about me. I was there. This is the seat the enemy wants you to stay in. If, 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 if he doesn't get you with betrayal and blame, he'll make you feel insecure because you're always bypassed. Well, I guess I don't have a word. I guess I can't be a business owner. I guess nobody sees me. I guess I'll always be an administrative assistant. I guess I'll, I'll, I guess I'll always be this person because nobody yet has seen the goodness in me. They haven't seen the greatness in me. The dreams that God's given me in my notepad don't line up with the experiences that I have with people. So maybe I really am not what God said. I am what they've said. I don't feel seen. I don't feel like anybody notices me. I have been bypassed. And for two years... Joseph sits in a jail, his faith probably fading every day because nobody considered him. They gave him no other thought. And this is going to be one of the hardest things. <laughs> it's unfair. It's unfair they don't see you. It's unfair they haven't acknowledged you. It's, un it's unfair they've never sang your song. Like, I want to validate it. It's unfair that your family always forgets your birthday. It's unfair that they didn't do the same thing that you did for all of them. They don't even remember it. They didn't even give it another thought. It's unfair. You lent them the money, and then in the moment you needed anything, they called you selfish. It's unfair that they keep bypassing you. But are you going to sit in it? Are you going to stay in it? And I know it's hard, but you could stay here for the rest of your life. Any of these chairs are lifelong chairs. Oh, I know people right now that are dead sitting in these chairs. Because they never forgave unfair, because they never moved past the offense, because they never let the, the, the work that Christ did come in and change them. They're still in these chairs. I don't care how old you are. I'm over that already. No, baby. You're still sitting in it. I need some people that have been bypassed. Pastor Barbara, come on. Oh, yeah, because they bypassed you because of your age. And they bypassed you because of your color. And they bypassed. Come on, just sit in it. And I want you to see yourself right now. Come on, Charles, sit on the back side of that. It doesn't matter. I want you to see. Just zoom out for a second. I want everybody to see that it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what has happened to you. All people have had these things happen to them. You've either been betrayed, blamed, or bypassed. And what the enemy wants you to do is, watch this, stay seated. Stay seated there. He will bring people along to encourage you. Like, no, 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 no. Don't get free. Hang on to that. You don't deserve that. They deserve not to have you at Thanksgiving. They deserve not to have relationship with your kids. They deserve, if it was me, stay there. Stay. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't let them go of that blame. I know God forgave you for everything that you've done, but please receive something that you won't give away. No, 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 no. They're, they're never going to see you. So don't see anybody else. So start looking over people like they looked over you. So start, start comparing and competing. Because if they don't see you, prove to them, make them see you. Overcompensate. Become something that you're not so that people who bypass you will never bypass me again. Now your motivation is not purpose, it's pain. Your motivation is no longer what is God trying to do? How is he trying to do it? It's the pain that I've experienced. And look at Joseph's life. He's betrayed by his brothers. He's blamed by Potiphar's wife. He's bypassed by the person, the one person who was supposed to remember him. And what happens is Joseph in that moment is sitting there and he probably is like, yo, this sucks. And somehow, out of everything that happened to him, he still 
was able to stay usable by God. And my question to you is, are you still usable by God, even though the situation is unfair? Can I tell you how I know he was usable by God? It's because two years later, the Pharaoh had a dream. And nobody could interpret the dream. The magicians, the soothsayers, nobody could interpret the dream. And then the cupbearer finally has an aha moment. It's like, bro, well, there is this cupbearer named, I mean, there is this guy named Joseph. When I was down there, he the one that told me that everything was going to be okay. And uh, you know what I'm saying? My bad. I forgot about him, but he probably could help you. They called him up. They changed his clothes immediately. They put him in an upgraded situation. They brought him before the king. And the king said, can you tell me what this dream has meant? Most people, after all of the pain that happened to them, even when I get to the palace, I'm so jaded, I don't even want to use my gifting anymore. Oh, you know it. I've been betrayed. I've been blamed. I've been bypassed. I don't care who you are. I don't care if this is the opportunity that God's been promising me. I don't care. I will keep from you what God has given me because I won't forgive unfair. It was unfair what happened to me, so you're not going to get what God gave to me. The crazy thing about it is, that wasn't Joseph's response. Joseph had learned how to forgive unfair to the point where he was still usable. God could speak to him, and it did not have all of his experience on what he said. When God speaks through you, does it have your experience on it? Is it pure or is it defiled by all of the stuff that's in you? Let me, let me give you a real example because all of these things happened when I went to build my first home. Me and Natalie were a young couple. We had a couple dollars we had saved up. I was in the, um, in the process. Bishop Gary's here. I was in the process of becoming the lead pastor of the church, and I ran into a bad contractor. I ran into a contractor from hell. I ran into a situation that was the most horrible situation. In that situation, I was betrayed because I trusted him. They went to the church. Ain't you a Christian, bro? Don't you love God? But you, so I was betrayed because there was trust. I was blamed for stuff that didn't happen. And literally, we went to have a meeting to work it out. And before we got to the meeting with Bishop, Bishop, am I telling the truth right now? Okay, you're in here. You know what happened. He had already taken a lien out on my house. Before we talked, he said, I'm going to bypass his character and what we talked about and all that. And I'm going to take a lien. For two and a half years, I had a lien on my house. And I was paying, if anybody knows anything about houses, it was a construction loan, and I was paying interest payments only. So for a house that was supposed to cost me $800 a month, we were paying almost $3,000 in interest every month. Now, y'all, I was broke, bro. I, I wasn't even, I wasn't, no, I didn't have nothing. I ain't had no book, no relationship goals. I was just trying to hold on to Natalie. I didn't have nothing. Ramen noodles was like, we eating up tonight, you know what I'm saying? The dollar menu was dinner, lunch, and breakfast, okay? And literally, watch this. The whole time I was there, I was preaching more than I'd ever preached in my life. I was on the platform every Sunday. And what ended up happening is after I got out of that situation, two weeks before I became the lead pastor of Transformation Church, my parents came into a little bit of money and loaned me and Natalie the money to get out of this lean situation that we had already wasted almost $30,000 on that we'll never see again. God did not come and smite him. I mean, I prayed that several times. Father, just from on high, come down, smite. You know when you start using Bible words to kill people? Smiteth them, Lord, thine now. I had to pay it. After I'd been betrayed, blamed, and bypassed, I had to pay for it. And what I found out, y'all, is that God was trying to figure out in me before I took this church, how much could I take 
and not let the bitterness come out through me to the people. Actively, I had to forgive unfair. And the only reason Joseph was able to interpret the dream to Pharaoh is because all along the way, he was forgiving every unfair situation. Now, can I tell you where it culminates? Remember who betrayed him? It was his brothers. Well, a famine comes into the lamb that's revealed in this dream that he has. Y'all, the reason why this is taking so much is because this is almost nine chapters of the Bible that I'm paraphrasing for you. You should go back and read it yourself. But this is the thing that happened. There was a famine in the land and, and God gave um, um, Joseph the insight to tell Pharaoh, hey, we need to save up for seven years because there's going to be a famine for seven years. And that's when we're going to be able to do stuff because he was open because he didn't sit in any of these chairs and stay in them. He was able to be used by God. Pharaoh was like, yo, is there anybody else as smart as him? Nope. You are now number two. Now watch this. From the prison to the palace, because he was still usable by God. One night from prison to palace, because he did not sit and stay in any of these chairs. I'm telling somebody, your situation's about to change. If you will not let the betrayal, the blame, and people bypassing you keep you there, you're going for the upgrade. Somebody say the upgrade. He got the ultimate upgrade, but the test wasn't over. See, most people think success means you won. He's second in command over the entire land. But the test is really about to come because his brothers and his father fell into famine as well. Now he's sitting in the seat of power. Now you're not helpless no more. Now you got your stuff together now. Now you got a friend group. Now you're doing some things. He's in a seat of power and the people who betrayed him now need his blessing. What do you do when the people who betrayed you, blamed you, and bypassed you now need your blessing? This is where most believers forfeit it all. I don't care what you say to me. This last chair of unfair, I'm sitting in. It's the chair of bitterness. Because you betrayed me, you blamed me, and you bypassed me, and now I'm something, now I'm going to be bitter. What do you need? Huh? Are you talking to me? You remember the same person? Oh, y'all going to act like y'all don't be paid. Are you talking about the same person you passed up? Are you talking about the same person you don't want to pick for the team? You talking about the same person that you wouldn't give a job, now you need a job? Huh, can you please make a presentation to why I should? Y'all know how we be acting so prideful. Could you please let me know why I should give you an opportunity after everything that you've done, after be, hold on, excuse me? I was trying to figure out. I was trying to figure out if you deserve my forgiveness. Oh, y'all want to be for real? When we sit in the seat of bitterness, the ultimate plan of God for our life gets thwarted because they don't deserve. Come come on, sit in the seat of bitterness with me. Now he has people he pays that could be bitter with him. (sighs) Come on, come on. Sit in the seat of bitterness with me. Yeah, I, I, yeah, these are people I pay. You're, you're a mother. You could nurture. Oh, do y'all know that's what families do? It's generational bitterness that we pass on. From one generation to the next generation. And so you were mad at them, and that's why we don't mess with uncle such and such, and that's why this happened, and, and now I start carrying the offense. I feel it. And the bitterness, it passes on to another generation. And, it, and for many of us, the racism in your household is nurtured. This was, this was nurtured. This was pacified. 
the, the financial poverty in your life was nurtured. The, the fears and the insecurities, that was, nur you nurtured your children. You were nurtured to feel this way. So now I'm just going to sit in bitterness. I'm going to let you prove to me. And Joseph somehow figured how to navigate all these chairs. He figured out how to forgive unfair. I'm not saying that it was easy. I'm not saying that he probably didn't pop down in one of these chairs every once in a while. I'm not trying to act like this is a, I mean, he, in this bitterness season, he was struggling. He put them through a whole situation. Like he, he like, he was like, go back and tell your brother to bring Benjamin, bring the other boy and then bring him back and then go get your daddy. And then like, but he was probably, uh, am I going to be bitter? Am I? Am I actually going to be used by God? Am I actually going to be a blessing? Am I actually going to reach my purpose? Or am I going to sit in the seat of bitterness? Does everybody understand what I'm trying to say? We have to navigate on our journey with God. People are going to mess you up and you're going to have opportunities to be betrayed, but I got to move around it. And I'm going to want to sit in this blame, but I got to get up out of it. And I got to, I got to be able to navigate people who bypass me and I got to be able to sidestep bitterness so that I can reach purpose. Can I, can I help you? I know I'm way over time, but somebody needs this. Somebody's pulling on me right now. This was from this point, 17, to this point, 39. 22 years of forgiving unfair. 22. I want you to think about from being thrown into the pit by the people you trusted all the way now to be sitting here with their lives in your hand. You tried to control my life. Now I have control over yours. Could God trust you with your offender? I'm not asking, I'm not saying, it may never happen, but I'm, I'm just asking you. Could God trust you? Have you forgiven all y'all self-righteous people that act like you're on? I don't need this series. I don't. Okay, go, go, go. Could God trust you with the life of the person who betrayed you? Y'all know I can't never talk to you about something that the God's not ever working in my heart. That man who um, did us wrong. He, he, I, when I tell you, he played us. Mama said, yeah, he did. <laughs> Everything she say sounds spiritual. And that was just like, yeah, he did. He played us. I mean, played us so bad to the point, point where I paid for, for heat and air. And at, at that moment, we prayed for a new furnace. And it was the coldest winter Tulsa had seen in like a decade. And we had just brought Isabella home, our first baby. We went to turn on the heat. And it said, clunk, clunk, he never put in the heat in our house. The first months of my daughter's life, she was born in September. This was about January. The first few months of her life, we had seven or eight space heaters and we slept in full clothing, beanies, gloves, two pairs. Of, this was literally seven years ago. And then that man's son, Showed up at my doorstep three years ago. Natalie was like, Mike. <laughs> Mike. I was like, what? He was like, hey, um, I just needed some help, da, 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 because he knew where we lived because he used to come for the job site. And when his son needed help, After I've been betrayed and there's still no resolve. You got my money. You didn't do the job. You didn't. Do now I had something that mattered to him. And what was going to come out? I said, hey, bro, ride with me to the bank. And I went to the bank. And I blessed the socks off of that little boy. Not because I wanted to.
It was because I remembered what God had done for me. And what I'm telling somebody right now, I know it's hard to even think about. But if you're ever going to be able to walk in the blessing that God has called you to be, you're going to have to forgive people who have done things to you that were unfair. It'll never be fair. It'll never be right. They may never apologize. But will you not just give them the moment, but you give, him, give them the momentum God placed in your life? Don't sit. Hebrews 12, 15. See, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no, watch this, root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. When you let bitterness be the root of your success, the root of where you move to, the root of the political party you support. If you let bitterness be the reason why you form friends. I only mess with black people because they get my, hold on, hold on, hold on. Was that formed in the root of bitterness? Like, I'm not saying you, okay, all your friends is black, but it's the reason they all black. It's because somebody did your family wrong who was white. If it's the, if the root of it, it's bitterness. Destruction will follow. I need everybody to go back and identify why and what you do. Because if the root of it is bitter, if the root of why you're so successful is bitterness because they never saw you, if the root is why you give so much is because of bitterness that nobody ever gave to you, I'm just telling you, you can be doing the right thing the wrong way. You can be serving God out of trying to do good and prove your salvation. But the root of it is bitter. So Pastor Mike, what do I do? Okay, I got to give this to you really fast. Um, three things that I found in Joseph's life. If you're going to forgive unfair, the first thing you have to do is no matter what's going on, believe God is with you. Like even in the unfair situations, look what it says in Genesis 39 two. It literally says it in every one. I can't list them all. But it says the Lord was with Joseph. So in the midst of the betrayal, he was with Joseph. In the midst of them blaming him, he was with Joseph. When they bypassed him, God was sitting right there with him. When they tried to make him bitter, God was right there. Somebody needs to say, God is with me. Say it again, God is with me. No matter the blame, betrayal, bitterness, or the bypass, God is with you. And because God is with you, watch this. It says, so he succeeded in everything he did in an unfair situation as he served in the home of the Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed, people will notice and realize, yeah, the Lord is with him. And it gave him success in everything he did. Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. This is God prophetically speaking to somebody right now in an unfair situation. Fear not. They left you, they played you, they did you wrong. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I just feel God telling somebody, the situation is unfair, but God is with you. Somebody say it again, God is with me. I don't care what seat you are tempted to stay in. God is saying, I am. I am with you. And so the next thing that I learned when I looked at Joseph's, Joseph's story, watch this, this is important. Being in an unfair situation doesn't release you of your responsibility. Most of us, when, when we're in an unfair situation, we feel entitled to not produce. It's unfair. So I ain't got to do nothing. 
God said, uh, <laughs> my plan for you didn't change. Did you know that Joseph, see, this is where either you believe the scripture or you don't. Romans 8 says all things, even the betrayal, all things, even the blame, all things, even the bypass, all things, even the bitterness are working together. So God does not take off the, he didn't relieve me from preaching when I was going through the betrayal. He didn't allow me and Natalie to stop pursuing purpose in ministry when we found out MJ had autism. That is not fair that my son turned five last week and can't speak a complete sentence to me. That's not fair. But it didn't take the responsibility that God sent me here with off of the plate. And I could sit and blame. I could sit and blame God, blame the doctors, blame everybody else and not be able to get up here and help you. I could, but I had to forgive unfair. I, had, I sat in the seat for a while. I stayed in it for a minute. Let me be clear with you. I tried to blame it. I don't want to act like I was, oh no, I didn't know. I was pissed. I was mad at God. I was mad at the situation. I tried to blame everybody. Was it me? Was it Natalie? Was it shots? Was it all of this other stuff? And God said, but um, while I'm walk, working all of this out, I need you to be working. I, I know it's unfair, but I didn't take away what I put on you. And some of y'all are sitting in stuff thinking that the responsibility God sent you here with is now excused because the season is hard. But God is saying the season is hard and I'm still good. The season is jacked up and I'm with you. I did not take my hand off of you just because the situation is unfair. And some of you have been sitting trying to defer your responsibility. And God's saying, I still got work for you to do. Every step of the way, Joseph had something to do. When he was betrayed, he had something to do. When he was blamed, he had something to do. When he was bypassed, he had to interpret a dream. Even when he was bitter, he had to bless his brothers. I got to move. James 1.12, blessed is the one. Who, who preserves under trial, perseveres under trial. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So, hold on, man. What am I supposed to do? Believe that God is with me? keep moving in situations and take my responsibility even though it sucks? This is the last thing I found out about Joseph. This one's a little raw. You're going to have to, if you're going to forgive unfair, you're going to have to serve when it sucks. Serve when it sucks. He's in the prison. He did, watch this, nothing wrong. Like, I would have been in pro prison because I, I might have touched Potiphar's wife's booty. Oh, y'all going to be fake. Like, I might, I, me? Is she every day? <sighs> so there could have been some fault. I want you to get this. Joseph did nothing wrong. He's sitting in prison. And he still was asked of God to use his gifts. Wow. Will you sing when it sucks? Oh, come on. Will you pray for people when it sucks? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. I got a good one. Will you pray for the president when it sucks? Yeah. It's so crazy that a whole group of people ready to pray for the president, but you didn't pray for the one that's there now. But then that group is ready to stop praying for the president because it's not the one. What? When it sucks. Will you still serve? Will you still give? Will you still love? Will, will you still, can you forgive unfair that you can serve? Joseph was able to serve even when it sucked, when it wasn't fair, when they did him wrong. Colossians 3.23. 
work willing. I figured it out, Charles. He wasn't serving the cupbearer. He wasn't serving the baker. He wasn't serving Potiphar or Potiphar's wife. He wasn't serving his brothers. He wasn't serving none of them. He was serving the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord. Rather than for the people who can betray you, blame you, bypass you, or make you feel bitter. I don't know who you are, but you've been pulling on me all week. That your next thing in moving in progression of forgiveness is us validating that what happened to you was unfair. It's unfair. Somebody this week needs to write down every unfair thing that happened to you. Let, and let me say it. That was not supposed to happen to you. That was a breach of trust. That was wrong. It was unfair. But the thing I'm telling you now is you don't have to sit there. You don't got to stay there. You can forgive unfair. One more thing. This is a bonus right here because somebody needs this. Genesis 41:50. 41, 50. When, when, when the reason I know that he was able to continue to forgive through this whole situation is because in the land when he got the upgrade, he got a wife and then he had two kids. And the Bible, for some reason, you got to see the details. In Genesis 41, 50, he said, during this time, before the first time of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife. In verse 51, it says, Joseph named his older son Manasseh. For he said, now watch, he ain't met his brothers yet. None of this happened. But this is how he's able to keep his posture. He named his son. God has made me forget all the troubles and everyone in my father's family. Huh? Hold on. I was so clear through the betrayal, the blame and bypass that what I named my next season was God has been faithful to make me forget what that was. And he named a second son. I'm preaching right now. He named him Ephraim, which means God has made me fruitful in the land of my grief. God made me fruitful where you thought I was going to die. In the pit you throw me in, I was able to succeed. When you tried to blame me for something I didn't do, God made me fruitful in the place of my grief. What I want you to know is don't name out of your pain. What if Joseph would have named what he was able to birth in a better season based on what he had been through? Don't name it out of your pain. I know this is a jacked up season, but name it preparation. Don't, uh, don't name it the failure. I know they left you, but name it a practice round. Don't put a name on it that sums up Why are you saying that? Because God can't deliver if you've already decided. If you've already decided this is the worst thing that ever happened to me and nothing good's going to come out of it and I'm going to stay depressed and I'm going to stay in anxiety, then God says, I'm a gentleman. I only can move if, like, if, you, if you let me come in. But if you've already decided this is going to be that, Joseph never decided that God couldn't use the unfair. He never decided. He never said, I'm going to hold on to this forever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to never let this go. What are you trying to say, Pastor Mike? Don't put a period where God has put a comma. After the betrayal, God said, next part of the story. After the blame, comma, next part of the story. After the bypass, comma, next. What if Joseph would have put a period there? This is it. We wouldn't be talking about him today. Ooh, so much to go through. I got to stop. Thank you, Lord. Okay. So all I'm, all I'm trying to get you to say, surrender your chair. I just think, like, if you've been sitting in this chair, what our Savior did on the cross is he sat in the chair of betrayal. He took up all the space in that chair so that you would never have to sit in. He was blamed 
for what he didn't do. He, he, he resolved every bit of blame so you wouldn't have to say. He was bypassed by even the ones he called disciples. Do you remember he forgave gave unfair when he washed Judas's feet? He the one that told him, hurry, go do what you got to do. Because what you're doing is a part of the plan that God has for me. It's part of the purpose. So I'll wash your feet and then let you go betray me. tasted the cup of bitterness so that you if you accept Jesus you can get up out of the chair come on get up if you accept Jesus you can get up out of the chair if you accept Jesus you can get up out of the chair if you accept Jesus you can get out of the chair and what happens when you forgive is freedom happens now you can walk around come on now you can move freely now there's no limits to what God can do in your life when you're able to forgive unfair. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but you need to accept what Christ has done for you. Y'all just stay up here. We just, this is all just, just stay right here. The most beautiful part about this story that I really want to work, but I can't right now, is that in Genesis 45, Joseph's brothers come up to him and he says, I can't take it no more. It's me. It's the one you betrayed. It's the one you thought you killed. It's the one that you, that you didn't think much of back then. It's me. And everything that culture says to me is I should hold it against you. But look what Joseph does. Look at it. Genesis 45. Let's go to verse 3. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? I haven't seen him in 22 years. But his brothers were speechless. Your offenders don't know what to say when they get called. Speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Verse 5, this is where he says to them, F you. This is where he releases them. But don't be upset. And don't be angry with yourselves. Forgive you. Go watch Pastor Mike's week 5 message. Don't, don't forgive yourself for selling me to this place. I have forgiven unfair so much that now I have perspective. It was God who sent me here. Oh, ahead of you to preserve your lives. Every unfair situation was not a set back. It was a set up to be able to preserve generations. Verse eight, now his perspective is getting even better. So it was good. And it was God who sent me here. Not you. Baby, you don't get to claim this victory. You might have been a part of this, but you don't get to claim what God is doing. And he is the one who made me the advisor, the manager of this entire place, and the governor of all Egypt. Last point. Unfair, your unfair situation, surrendered to God. It's not a destination, it's direction. Every situation directed Joseph to his ultimate purpose. Every unfair situation uh, was a part of the direction. How do I get Joseph from a different country all the way to being number two in charge over Egypt? I gotta send some unfair situations. <laughs> I got to allow people not to see exactly who they are, what he is. And, and you know it's not the devil because I'm with him every time. I didn't leave him. I'm just going to go through it with him. And if he doesn't get his heart bitter, but he can forgive unfair, I'm going to use him in a mighty way. And the Lord was with Joseph. Today, I need to pray for you. I don't have a nice, tidy ending to this. 
This is not a, this is not a, and now we all pray. Like, this is not that message. My question to you is, have you sat down in one of these chairs? And have you gotten comfortable? Today, if you're sitting in the seat of betrayal, the unfair, like remember, it is unfair. Unfair is never fair. It shouldn't have happened to you, but it's unfair. And now you've chosen to sit in the unfair chair of betrayal, blame, being bypassed, and bitterness. Today, all I want to offer you by the power of Jesus Christ is an opportunity to get up. If you want to get up out of one of those chairs all over the world, if you're watching, I want you to make a prophetic act. I want you to stand up right now, all in this room, all over the world. If you're saying, God, I want to get up out of one of these chairs. I don't know which chair it is. I don't know who you got the offense with. I don't know who the problem is with. But if there's somebody, a family member, a person, anything that you've been sitting in one of these chairs, I want you to prophetically right now, get off your bike, get off the porch, stand up. Oh, don't take all of that. All I'm telling you is something is about to happen right now. God is about to start healing and moving somebody because you're about to begin to forgive on chair. Come on, would you do me another favor and lift your hands? Because this is the sign of surrender. Remember what I said. If you surrender the unfair to God, it's not going to be the destination. You won't stay there. It's going to be direction. Hands lifted. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray by your spirit that every person that has been harboring unforgiveness for somebody, some situation, something that has happened, Father God, that has been unfair. I'm asking you, Father God, to do what you did for Joseph. Number one, be with them. God, I thank you that your word says you are an ever-present help in the time of trouble. And Father, every place we've been in trouble, whether it's been in betrayal, Father, or we're in trouble in blame, or we've been in trouble because we've been bypassed, or we're in bitterness, God, I thank you that right now by your spirit that you would be with us God, I'm asking you that people's purpose will come alive again today in the name of Jesus where people have sat down in one of these chairs and taken off the responsibility. I thank you that a new fire would raise up on the inside of them, that no longer would they be stagnant or stuck, but because of what you did on the cross, they can get up out of that thing. God, I thank you that even when the season sucks, that you're going to produce an ability to serve on the inside of them serve their family, serve their husband, serve their wife, serve that business. God, I just thank you. Today, somebody is getting up. Somebody's getting up. You went down so we could get up. You went down and defeated death, hell, and the grave so that we could get up. We celebrate the resurrection, but we rarely talk about the battle and the reason why you call, we call you champion, why you are the undefeated king is because, Father God, the unfair situation of the world's sin, you took it upon your shoulders. And if we believe, you went down so we could get up. I'm praying, God, today this message begins to change the trajectory people's future do the work Holy Spirit that only you can do I can't talk them into it father they kind of want this father God and ask for your help but you are so good that you said anybody who believes can me can come boldly to the throne of grace and ask for help father here we are saying help us help us get up out of the seats help us forgive unfair if you're under the sound of my voice right now in that same heart posture, there's somebody here that's never asked God to be the Lord of their life. And I'm telling you, this is the only thing that allowed me to get up out of the chair. I can, I can go through situation after situation where one day I'm sitting in that chair, the next day I'm sitting in that chair with my family, I'm sitting in this chair and with the person up the street, I'm sitting in this chair and God's saying, hey, if you let me help you and be with you, we can work this thing out. I'm standing here today not being perfect, but progressing. I used to be comfortable in these chairs. And now I have a conviction not to let these chairs become my home. Today, I want to offer that to you. 
If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior today, I want to give you the greatest gift that you could ever have. Not a perfect life, but a progressing life. One that is brought to you by Jesus Christ himself. And he leaves us a gift of the Holy Spirit, who the Bible calls the paraclete, the one who will walk alongside of us in everyday journey. I'm telling you, I do not know how people live their life without God. I do not know how people made it through this election without God. I do not know how people live without all of the fear and anxiety and they don't have the tools of prayer and faith and hope I'm telling you right now it's the one thing that changes everything it'll take you from being a liar addicted to pornography a manipulator like me and it won't make you perfect but it'll give you the perfect one who can change your whole life if you want to be added into this prayer I'm about to say According to Romans 10, 9, all you have to do is believe and confess that Jesus Christ died for you and that he rose again with all power just so you could get up out of these chairs. If you believe that, I know religion tells you you need to confess everything that you did today and you need to tell people about the secret sins. What God says to you is that if you give me all of your brokenness, I'll help you change your habits. I'll walk with you through that. And today, I want to offer that to you. On the count of three, we're about to pray. But if you want to be included in that prayer, I just want you to slip your hand in the air. One, you're making the greatest decision of your life. Two, we are so proud of you. But more than that, God is proud of you. Three, if that's you, I want you to put your hand up in the air all over this world. I know their hands going up all over the world. Last week, 199 people gave their life to Christ. In this year, over 20,000 people. Oh, y'all better help me. This is why this church exists. And heaven is about to rejoice because you're about to be added to that number. I don't care who's around you. I don't care what you did last week. I don't care what you did last night or what you planned for tomorrow. The day and the moment of salvation is right now. Transformation Church is a family. Nobody prays alone here. So we're all going to pray this prayer for the benefit of those who are coming to God. Come on, just slip your hands up and say, God, thank you. Ah, Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for raising again for me. Today I believe you. And I put my faith in you. I believe you lived, you died, and you rose again. So I could get up out of this chair. Change me. Renew me. Transform me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we give God praise all over the, oh, come on. If you're watching on rebroadcast, if wherever you're at on the track, let's give God praise. Come on, somebody is recognizing. We want to walk with you. If you just made that decision, I want you to text the number that's coming up on the screen right now. I want you to text this number and I want you to get next steps. We want to walk with you. This is not something that's just going to be, oh, yeah, now I'm coming to Christ and everything. No, 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 no. We're about to go on a journey. We're going to go from triumph and we're going to see victory, but every victory has a battle. And so we're going to go through these battles together. And we're going to see God do something. If I could tell you next week, I'm going to talk about forgiving fathers. God's very clearly given me the message next week and how important fathers are to this whole thing of forgiveness. If you got daddy issues, if you're a bad father now and you wanna be a better one, if you're a good father and you wanna know how to be better, if you can't stand your daddy, everybody needs to watch next week. I have a word from God. And I want us to go through this journey. We only got about three, four more weeks left in this series. But I'm telling you, I feel the healing virtue of God starting to flow. And I don't want you to miss what God has for you. We're praying for you. We love you. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Watch this sermon again. Go back and watch other things. Watch some other ministries. Get in your Bible for yourself. Because if we're going to be the church of Jesus Christ that raises up and makes a difference right now, we got to be transformed by the word of God. I love you. I'm praying for you. I believe in you. Go out this week and live a transformed life. I love you. What's going on, family? I wanted to come and personally tell you about something that is a tradition here at Transformation Church. At the end of every year, we bring our faith, our crazy faith, to an offering. 
We call it our end of the year offering. And what we do is we set aside a moment to ask God, hey, is there anything you want us to give? Give to this mission, this vision, this idea of representing God across the whole world. And literally for the past six years, we've been doing it. And it has been the catalyst for everything else that we've done as a church. We've been able to help end sex trafficking. We've been able to buy this building and pay for it in five months because of the generosity. The cameras that you are watching us on right now were because of somebody's crazy faith to give in an end of the year offering. I think back and literally when the church first started, it was the faith of a few people, less than 300, who gave $80,000 that produce the cameras that are seeing so many, over 19,000 salvations have come this year, but it started with the faith of somebody. And I wanna ask you to partner with us. Join in, not giving an amount, asking God, is there something you want me to give? And I promise you, when you ask him, he'll speak to you. This is not about amounts, this is about growing in our faith. And I know that in a year where many of us would be tempted to hoard or keep or protect what we have. At Transformation Church, we move in generosity. We give just to give, not to give. We step out in faith, we believe in God, and we believe in miracles. And I believe that God right now is placing something on you and your family's heart, like he's doing for me and Natalie and our family. And we're all on December 6th gonna give in our crazy faith offering. I'm telling you, what I've seen God do in this season of the year has been something that will never, ever, nobody can ever convince me that God is not moving in this moment. And so I want you to join us. This is the step of faith that maybe you've been praying for. This is the step of faith that's going to prove that all the growth as we've gotten stronger this year actually has action in your life. And I'm so grateful and I'm gonna be praying with you that whatever God says for you to give, you would obey. See, what we know is that obedience is better than any sacrifice we could give. And we're gonna move this thing together. So December 6th, Crazy Faith Offering, you can give and I'm so excited to see what God does in this church as we re represent him to the lost and found for transformation in Christ. God bless you.